Welcome everyone on behalf of the Office for Diversity and Inclusion. I will pass it on to Elizabeth, who is the lead for the Caregivers ERG for an introduction. Welcome. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that for, for that warm introduction. So as Elizabeth said, my name is Elizabeth Tanoy and I'm one of the leads for um, the Caregivers ERG at um, Mount Sinai. Um, just to give you guys just a little background about the employee um, ERG, um, you know, the Caregivers ERG, I believe was started maybe about, um, I would say maybe about two or three years ago. Um, and since then um, it's uh, expanded and it's transitioned into, um, you know, several things. So today we have um, a presentation, um, you know, on memory, memory 101, as it um, relates to, um, you know, any cognitive issues um, that folks might be having as it relates um, to various conditions. But definitely keep in mind that our ERG um, will be bringing live to you um, several other um, presentations that we have in mind. Um, for example, we will be doing, um, you know, a presentation on brain health as it relates um, to COVID-19. Um, we have um, presentations coming up, um, you know, how does caregiving look like um, for various communities. So I'm excited and I'm also very excited um, to have Dr. Ampriere here here and also to have, um, you know, Miss Chin here. So without further ado, um, please give your warm welcome and attention to um, Dr. Ampierre and um, Miss Chin. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you so much to the um, Caregiver ERG for having us today. The Caregiver ERG is very close to my heart because we started it together with the Office of um, Diversity and Inclusion about three years ago, as Elizabeth said. And today we're going to focus on talking about cognitive health across the lifespan. It's gonna be a very informal presentation. We're gonna to touch on several topics, but the most important one is many of our older adults don't really wanna hear about memory and losing their memory or Alzheimer's disease. So um, we just wanna put that out there so you know that it is a, it's a topic that is charged with many emotions and who we are. So besides um, being part of the ERG and leading Mount Sinai Calm, I am also part of the Mount Sinai Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, where I work in the outreach and engagement core, as well as in our caregiver support program with Sean Shin, who you can see in the screen. And the ADRC is one of 30 centers of excellence dedicated to the study of cognitive health. Alzheimer's disease is one of the major, um, of, you know, the just the biggest problem we have in terms of cognitive health. And it's a, one of the main focus of our investigations, but we also have other related disorders such as um, vascular dementia, mixed dementia, and we'll talk a little bit about the um, collection of dementias that actually cause memory loss and um, memory disorders in older adults. So we're going to talk about cognitive health and aging, a little bit about what's Alzheimer's disease, what are the risks and protective factors, how to stay healthy, and very importantly, how to care for the caregiver. And towards the end, we're gonna talk a little bit about caring for the caregiver in the times of COVID and as we are approaching post-pandemic um, months. So we know that fear of Alzheimer's disease in the United States is great and increases exponentially. So with that in mind, part of our work is really to conduct outreach in um, underserved communities where health literacy is a bit challenging. So we have worked with um, community collaborators to develop programs and strategies, including videos um, that use entertainment education strategies to um, educate our um, communities on what is Alzheimer's disease? What is memory health? What happens with our memory as we get older? And um, based on that, we kind of know that when we go out to senior centers, it's very important to share that we have some good news and some bad news. Um, serious memory problems are not part of normal aging. However, some memory changes are part of normal aging. 
memory changes gradually over time and mild memory problems are really with us as we get older. So what happens as we get older to our memory? Um, so it's harder to learn. Acquisition is a little slower. Storage is a little more time consuming and recalling information takes a little longer. So overall, we have a harder time learning new information, storing it and retrieving it. Um, so for example, I'm sure that some of you, if not all of you, have kind of misplaced your keys and you don't know where your keys are, but you certainly have never forgotten what your keys are for. So what we impress upon, like many times when we go out to senior centers and talk to seniors about memory and aging, they get very worried and they are either extremely worried about having um, some cognitive disorder or they're kind of like, don't wanna hear us. So the first thing we remind them is that um, we can help. And by the end of the conversation, they'll know a little bit about whether um, they should be worried and how to address their concerns. So another, topic of confusion is dementia versus forgetfulness. So dementia is really a combination of cognitive and functional decline. So in a way, if you forget what your keys are for, that's kind of like a sign of dementia. If you forget where you placed your keys, that's not necessarily um, a problem. That's usual natural aging process. Um, your function is intact, your language is intact, and you can continue to manage independently. Um, so what are some types of dementia? Um, as we said before, dementia is a collection of symptoms and vascular dementia is uh, caused by strokes or mini strokes. There's dementia due to Parkinson's disease, there's dementia due to alcohol, and or there could be a dementia due to a head trauma or injury. Um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. It is a progressive disease of the brain. The symptoms develop slowly. They get worse over time. But I think I want to highlight the fact that it is a slow progression, not an overnight progression. And these changes really interfere with memory, thinking, and independent functioning. And sometimes they affect personality. But the truth of the matter is that your loved ones are not going to wake up with um, Alzheimer's disease one day. It may be that one day you'll notice that there's something that you had not noticed before. And that may trigger um, some more deep observation. Um, so for example, here we can see the PET scan of a normal brain and the PET scan of a brain with Alzheimer's disease. Overall, um, I am not a basic scientist and I am not intentionally looking for the cure of Alzheimer's disease in the lab, but we know that researchers are still trying to find out best practices in terms of diagnosis, treatment, and causes of Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. So one thing we we know is that um, one of the key factors to address the lack or the, the gaps in knowledge is to encourage research participation. So to do that, we, um, we just uh, want to go back to our slides here. Um, We train the community and we try to impress upon them the importance of prevention 
diagnosis, treatment, and cure, because although we do not know all the specific um, ways in which we, you know, we still need to learn about these four things, we have, through research, learned a lot to address the needs of older adults who worry about their, um, their memory health. So, what have we learned about Alzheimer's disease? We have learned that the greatest known risk factor is age. We also know that genetics are important. Head injuries impact memory and brain health. We also know that what is good for the heart is good for the brain. Therefore, keeping a healthy diet, staying socially active are extremely important. We highlight the fact that to minimize cognitive impairments, having a healthy diet is key. Checking your hearing, your vision, preventing head injuries, managing diabetes, managing pain, preventing fatigue, being mindful sleep, addressing substance abuse and alcohol are super important. And a topic that is very close to my heart is lowering stress and managing anxiety, treating depression, um, sometimes decreasing multitasking, preventing information overload. And I want to take a moment to talk about how you can lower stress. As you probably know, here at Mount Sinai, we have a variety of programs that address the um, stress management and um, self-care needs of our employees. And we incorporate mind-body skills, um, learning and refinement through um, yoga, mindfulness, and Tai Chi. We've also opened these classes to family members and loved ones. Therefore, it might be of interest to think about incorporating older family members into um, these programs if you feel they might be interested, especially in these times of social distancing and, um, and social disconnection because of COVID. Um, so we know that early detection really matters. So we want to highlight the importance of knowing the signs. Memory loss does, that disrupts daily life is very important. And it's very interesting that sometimes, um, and this might be something to keep in mind in these times of the pandemic, we have noticed over the years um, working in the geriatric psychiatry clinic, also at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, that we had family members coming in to us with their loved ones after Christmas or after Thanksgiving. And why that is, is because people get together for family events, especially families who, are, who don't live in the same city. And, family members started noticing that there was a little bit of confusion and maybe difficulty completing the um, recipes that maybe mom or grandma um, had no trouble with in the past. So I think it's nice to think about this time of COVID as an opportunity to increase um, social connection and social attention to our older um, family members. And it's a tricky situation because we have been um, protecting them by keeping them socially, um, kind of like geographically, I mean, I guess physically distant. And um, if they're geographically far away, it's hard to, to kind of like get together in person. So Shahan will talk a little bit later about these specific um, things that we can do in the context of the pandemic to take care of our older um, adults and loved ones. Um, good nutrition is key, eating less um, fatty foods and eating more um, vegetables and plant-based um, foods is very important. And to highlight the fact, to highlight the importance of nutrition and also to kind of connect what we're talking about to 
to Mount Sinai Common Fit. Be, just remember that in the Mount Sinai Wellness Program, which is a benefit for all employees, we have certified diabetes educators and who are also nutritionists who can meet with you one-to-one -to, -one to evaluate your risk for diabetes, your risk for cardiovascular disease, to help you create a healthy diet for yourself and even for yourself and your family. So that's a benefit that you should keep in mind as you think about um, how to care for yourself as a caregiver. One thing that we also recommend that, that is an evidence-based um, practice is the Mediterranean diet. Um, research conducted in actually in Spain um, indicated that people who were in a Mediterranean-based diet, less fat, more um, fish and vegetables, um, legumes and nuts um, did better in cognitive testing than um, those who were not practicing these um, nutrition uh, styles. So protecting yourself is important. Adopting a Mediterranean diet is um, beneficial, exercising regularly. And again, another thing to consider is joining our Wellness Reset, which is a program available to all employees. And it kind of helps you to think of your self-care globally, not just your physical health, but also your mind-body health. We encourage mindful eating, we encourage mindful walking, and of course, we really encourage you to create your own, um, maybe your own teams, and work together, and try to um, give each other support, and try to come lead 10,000 steps a day, which is really challenging when you're working from home, but it really will motivate you to get out, take a walk, maybe um, take mindful walks and connect with each other. Um, what else can you do? Do the crosswords puzzles, play bridge, play board games, read, engage in art making, painting, sculpting, and for that, we also have a class here at 5.30 every Tuesday that can help you tap into your creativity and um, your uh, artistic side, which is always um, great to discover. Hi, Ida, how are you? So, back to the importance of research participation. As a caregiver of an older adult, you may wonder, how do I get my loved one tested? And are these testing, is this testing available widely? We at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center have a longitudinal study that um, gives us the opportunity of offering older adults with or without memory um, concerns the opportunity to participate in a research memory evaluation. And it is um, free of charge, of course, because it's a research study. And if you have, if you're interested in learning more about these um, opportunity, that would be um, great. And we, Shahan and I are happy to answer your questions. We have a few resources for you. Um, and we are going to shift our focus from why participate in research to supporting family and friends as an aspect of what we do at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And before we completely transition out of research participation, here's a slide that gives you very specific information about how to find out about different studies that are available for um, those with memory issues and without. But I would like to transition now and um, introduce you to Shahan Shin, 
who will talk a little bit in more detail about caring for the family caregiver. Hey everyone. Okay, so we're going to talk about caring for the family caregiver. Um, what we want to emphasize is developing a plan. So a plan of action. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Where we pull together a team. So it can be a team of, uh, including your family members, your friend networks, and also including services in your uh, local community. For example, Meals on Wheels. Uh, we want you to get in touch with other communities like uh, PSS, uh, Alzheimer's Association, Alzheimer's Foundation of America, and see what information and services they can offer you. Um, another thing, part of this plan is to try to take inventory of your supplies, right? We learned very early in March, remember the toilet paper, <laughs> remember the um, scarcity of some basic needs that was going on. We want you to, should something happen to, to have a good base of inventory in the house, should you have somebody have to quarantine or somebody has to step out, um, these supplies are in the house still. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, included in that is also keeping up to date a list of medications, um, medical contacts. It's very important to have these things um, about the person you're taking care of, um, but also have these things uh, available about yourself too, should something happen to yourself and you need help as well. Um, we want you to continue scheduling your medical appointments, uh, dentist visits, even consider virtual visits um, if uh, in-person is still not an option for you. Uh, we want you to keep your health going. Like all of the things that Mari was saying, all of these protective stuff uh, to, to protect your memory, it's, it's the same thing going on here where we want to keep supporting you. We, in this way. Um, another thing, oh, can you go back for a second? Sorry, <laughs> no problem. Um, is we want to keep up with digital, digital literacy, right? That's something else that we learned during this pandemic and in combating isolation and keeping connected is really making sure that we are able to connect with each other and to other peers online. And of course, maintaining um, safety and self-care planning, and also having a backup uh, should you fall ill as a caregiver. Next slide, please. So continuation of taking care of yourself, right? I talked about connecting with friends and family, uh, participating in online senior centers. They, they used to have memory cafes. The AFA has something called the Teal Room that has lots of activities you can do with your person. Um, they are now all virtual. And something to keep us going is to really tap into our creativity. Remember at the beginning, we were all baking sour bread uh, and people were coloring and people were th thinking of creative ways of connecting. I remember, I think people were singing outside of their balconies. You know, these are all very creative ways that we can keep um, connected with others. Um, and of course, going outside and getting enough sleep, at least eight hours if possible. So here are just a few of the resources that we have listed. We have, um, so I have this checklist and if you want a more broken down version of it, there's this link that you can click on. Um, this is, we have Meals on Wheels, we have the link to the AFA and Caring Kind. And along with that, I think in the next slide, we also have uh, other recreational things like Arts and Minds, which is a nonprofit organization um, committed to uh, improving the quality of life for people living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias where they provide art-centered uh, experiences. Um, 
self-help has another virtual senior center and also senior planet they have courses where you can um can get uh, you can learn more about operating Zoom, for example. You can keep connected, uh, how to keep connected with your friends. And they're all uh, catered to uh, seniors and people who are 65 and up. And of course, we have the Alzheimer's Association. Alls Connect is a uh, online forum that is from the Alzheimer's Association. And it's just a forum for caregivers to connect and talk to each other. And also we, al we want to continue following the NIH guidelines uh, uh, in prevention and protecting yourself from COVID-19. And um, there's a link here of, of more information about caring, of, about uh, caring for the caregiver. Um, I think at this moment, we can open it up to questions. I see we already have one. Um, I see Michelle Clemente, she asks, is it true that Alzheimer's can truly only be diagnosed after death? That is a very good question. And it is, it is true. And it is also possible that we can, there are PET scans that can actually identify um, areas of the brain that are not necessarily functioning properly, but the, there is still mixed, there are still mixed feelings about the causes of Alzheimer's disease. So although we could, some of the theory indicates that amyloid um, plaques and tangles are the one of the causes of Alzheimer's disease, or I guess the main cause for some schools of thought, and those can be identified on PET scans, it's really hard to say that that's really um, because sometimes there's an incongruency between the presence of these um, lesions in the brain and the severity of the symptoms. So yes, in fact, at the moment, um, Alzheimer's disease is absolutely diagnosed with, um, with an autopsy when um, you don't need your brain anymore, I say. Um, any other questions, thoughts, ideas? Uh, let's see. I see uh, there is high demand to see the resources. We can send them um, around and hopefully you can have access to the slides. What do you think, Mari? Yeah, we, send, we can definitely send a copy of the slides. And we also want to highlight that as part of Mount Sinai Calm, we are prepared to meet with you one-to-one -to, -one to create a self-care action plan for you as a caregiver um, and for you as a as an employee, and I just saw a great question. What is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? I love this question. Alzheimer's is a type of dementia, and there are a variety of um, so Al dementia is an umbrella term. And Shahan prepared this really fantastic um, slide with an umbrella. We can find it to show it to you today. Um, but yes, in general, Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia, is the most common dementia. And um, the term sometimes gets confusing. But in essence, dementia means a combination of cognitive and functional decline that impairs independent functioning. It can be mild, moderate, or severe. Um, at the moderate and severe stages, it really um, requires that the person has uh, support for protection of herself or himself and others. Um, it is also important to remember that um, there are several types of dementia and Cardiovascular dementia is also very prevalent and um, slightly has a slightly different presentation. It's a stepwise um, decline versus a very slow decline. 
and cardiovascular dementia is associated to TIAs um, and strokes and Alzheimer's disease. I mean, and they could have been concurrently, right? We could have TIAs and we could have Alzheimer's disease um, in, in our um, brain. So um, is loss of, of balance it. or motor skills associated? Yes, I think over time what happens is that your brain is like the hard disk of your computer. And when that hard disk is not functioning, your computer can't function. So if your brain does cannot send the correct messages to the rest of your body, then your body is going to, um, to start uh, failing. Absolutely. And if I can add, it's also sure. like with with the loss of balance, it's also because it's it's there's a perception thing going on. And so it can be hard for the person with the illness to discern how far an item is and then an accident might happen. Um, would you like to add a little bit more, Mari? I think that was a great example of like the, the challenges of caring for an older adult with um, severe Alzheimer's disease or severe dementia or a cognitive disorder, which is that everything gets impacted from hearing to seeing like all our senses. senses. And sometimes it's hard um, to kind of like imagine what it's like to have the challenges in perception um, to make sense of our world. So that's why we um, need to be supportive of those who have this um, type of disorder. Absolutely. I think we missed a question. How early in age can this start to develop? And what should you look for in an early age, if so? You mean early onset? Um, Alzheimer's disease? I think, uh, this question came from Sabrina. Um, I, if, I think that's what she's tapping on. Maybe she can. Uh, Sabrina, can, can you unmute yourself and maybe you can ask the question? Yes. I think she said yes. I think she's oh. talking about early onset. Oh, great. Excellent question. So yes, there is something called early um, I guess early onset Alzheimer's disease. And that is a very unique version of Alzheimer's disease is um, pretty much genetically, um, it's associated with genetics. And there's a lot of research being conducted with um, in specific regions of um, the world, including a specific region in Colombia, South America. But how, early can it start or develop is really pretty interesting. It could develop pretty early in, um, in, in our lives. Um, we consider early onset Alzheimer's disease when it starts or when the symptoms are evident before age 62. Mm -hmm. um, what should you look for is basically um, I think Alzheimer's disease continues to be a diagnosis of exclusion and getting a good diagnosis is super important. So your PCP is your first stop mm -hmm. and um, being aware of the baseline um, memory health is a first step. I th impairment, I think. Um, yeah, good. Sean. If I can add, um, I think one thing is if if you understand, like if considering that person's everyday routine and how they function, what are things that they used to be able to do with ease that they they that they seem to have more difficulties with. The and, and, and then another good, um, I guess, uh, another good kind of. Oh, like a red flag or, or time to check it up um, is the example we used earlier about the keys, right? You, you know what the keys are for, um, sorry, you, you, we, we lose the keys, but we don't lose um, understanding what the keys are for, right? They open our door. So if you start noticing these types of things, I think it's a good time to discuss it with the doctor 
and to get um, some more information. And personalized, um, you know, evaluations are very important. And if you Absolutely. have any of you in the audience have any questions or concerns, we can answer and we can guide you in um, connecting with care and exploring your loved one's um, health status. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Uh, yes, um, there's a question in the chat. Um, oh, the person answered I missed about um, someone had a question is forgetting names or words forgetfulness due to age or a sign of dementia good question i have good news for you um it is a normal sign of aging however i think it's a very important to keep in mind that it it could also be a sign of um lack of sleep yeah, it's a, it's a variety of things. Focus, concentration, and um, retrieving information can be a barrier to remembering somebody's name, especially if you're not expecting to see that person, if you have to all of a sudden introduce someone, and you're, you, you're so used to being with that person, and all of a sudden you're blanking out, that's okay. Um, but as always, if you're very concerned, we can definitely set up an opportunity to talk and maybe talk about stress and how you're coping with stress and what are options that you have to manage that stress, to decrease it and to um, increase your focus and concentration because that's also what happens as we get older, we need to make a bigger effort to concentrate and stay um, focused and, you know, transfer information into our long-term memory and our files um, where we can easily retrieve it. But There's another question. Um, is repeating the same story when certain situations arise a sign also? It depends on the severity. That is something to observe. I mean, we all tend I tend to repeat myself sometimes, um, but that's not here nor there. And I can just say that um, it is what family members notice often. It's like a, kind of like loved ones forget that they have told them the same story several times. So it is... It is something to keep in mind. I wouldn't say that it is definite, but it is something to keep in mind. There's one more question. Um, if someone consumes two to three beers on weekends, can this increase the possibility for Alzheimer's disease over the years? You know, the answer is um, relative. I think that we know that there is a connection between alcohol use and alcohol-related dementia. And everything in moderation is okay. The challenge is that sometimes people, their, their self-perception is off. So if it's three beers over the weekend, that seems to be fine. But usually people kind of like tend to minimize and so if it's like a six pack on a Saturday and a six pack on a Sunday, that's really a lot more. And so everything in moderation is okay. Uh, we don't want to say that, yes, that's a risk for dementia. Overall health is important. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. And we know that lower levels of alcohol are better than um, higher levels of alcohol. And no alcohol is probably ideal, like a plant-based diet, but we want everyone to enjoy life too. And that's a really important um, uh, protective factor, um, having good mental health, uh, managing your social connections, being, having a support active. network. Mm -hmm. Um, and it even better is if you can find an activity that kind of checks these things off, like um, like a like a Zumba class. I know dancing. 
Mm -hmm. where you're physical and it, it, you're, you're interacting with your other peers and you're learning something new. It's, all, it's checking off all of these kind of items and you're having fun. <laughs> and, and we can't stress that more. Having fun is a key um, protective factor for all kinds of diseases. And, um, uh, and we want to highlight that quality of life really is the the goal for all of us. We have another question. If you're concerned that someone has dementia and now feels you need to help them with their bills or medical care, but they are resistant to help and get a, and also a bit angry, how can you provide this care with outside facilities and agencies if you cannot access, get access to their documents? That is a very important question. And that's something that we can definitely help you with because there are some um, resources out there that could be very helpful. For example, there are elder law attorneys that help families with, um, I guess one very basic uh, place to start is a healthcare proxy. Having a healthcare proxy would be super helpful um, talking with that person about supporting them and um, connecting on a basic level of wanting to be there for them, um, normalizing the possibility that we all need someone else to support us, that nobody can do anything alone, and that life takes a village. That's uh, probably the first step in the conversation. And the second step, I would say, why don't you reach out to us individually and we can try to formulate an action plan that will be personalized. And then another question came in. Um, all right, <laughs> thank you. Um, is does noise or noise pollution affect memory? That's, That's very interesting. Yeah. It you definitely know, affects sleep which we concentration know memory i mean i think that noise noise pollution are um kind of like adversities that increase our stress and whether it is a direct cause for alzheimer's disease or dementia i cannot say but we can certainly find out and we can get back to you um, on the correlation between noise noise pollution and memory health we know that it impacts um, stress and stress reduction. Any other thoughts, questions? I know that there's, um, in our audience, there are, or there is a group of um, researchers that are working on light therapy. And I am wondering if they want to jump in and mention their work if we still have a little bit of time of course what is their name so i may be able to transfer them over oh, okay um, got it one second you got it oh jennifer bronze she's right there she will be joining us while Jennifer comes in, there's another question. Um, someone has asked if someone like a 40 year old would like to participate in a research program for dementia, is that possible? That is a very good question. And it depends on the program. If you want to reach out to us, we can um, orient them. But I'd like to give Jennifer a, a little um, time so she can tell us about her study. Maybe there's an opportunity for that person to participate in her study. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, hi, I'm part of a, a group that's newly forming in upstate New York that's part of the School of Medicine. Um, we are called the Light and Health Research Center. We've been doing lighting research for over 30 years as part of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, but now we're part of the Sinai family. So we're just forming our center, getting our new laboratories built. And we've been doing field research for years, working with patients that are struggling with various forms of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. We're working with light to help them 
have a high dose of light during the day so that when they go to sleep at night, they can consolidate their sleep and have a little bit better sleep pattern, stay asleep at night and be awake and alert during the day. This has been really successful in our nursing homes and other collaborators are eager to have us back now that COVID is settling down to the point that we can get in there. Um, so we put um, lights around where people hang out during the day, patients that are in real nursing homes or even still at home with their caregivers um, to where they tend to hang out during the day. They have a lot of light during the day with our special lights. And then we find that they are able to, to sleep a little better at night. And that's really makes them, them more comfortable and their caregivers a little happier if their day night patterns are more similar to the rest of society. So, so that's the, a little background. There's several different studies for which we're recruiting right now. Um, and I have some colleagues on the call as well and our director would be happy to speak as well to you. Uh, but we're looking for people in various stages of dementia who would be willing to put some lights in their home or where, wherever they're living. And, uh, and it's kind of a longitudinal study for something like six months, the various studies. Uh, where they would have lights in their home and they would um, wear a special light meter around their neck to see how much light they're getting during the day and then as it gets darker in the evening and when they actually go to sleep and wake up. So we're keeping track of their sleep-wake cycles and their activity versus rest patterns um, as a follow-up for, for many years of research. So that's just a quick background. Um, you can contact one of our nurses, uh, Barbara Plitnick, or you can contact me and I'll put you in touch with nurse Barbara Plitnick about the various research projects for which we're recruiting. Thank you, Jennifer, for jumping in. Um, this was a very spontaneous um, opportunity to have you over. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much, Mari. Are there any other questions, comments, um, ideas? Questions for Jennifer? I'm searching. Well, Elizabeth, I think, and that's it. I think um, that's it. We are happy to support all of you in your caregiver journey. We are happy to support you in your stress reduction journey, your um, overall wellness journey. <laughs> Join the Wellness Reset, participate in our Mount Sinai Com classes, and um, reach out to us for caregiver support to help you create a self-care action plan and or to um, ask us any questions. We would um, be happy to help you out. In the meantime, have a lovely afternoon.